Christ be with you. Welcome, St. Paul and friends, to this service of worship today. We are glad that you are here and that we can meet together uh, and worship God together. We want to also welcome today Reverend Jill Rankin Daniel, who is our preacher. Reverend Daniel is a native of Northeast Texas and has served as clergy United Methodist Church since 2000. She's a graduate of St. Paul. She served the Missouri Annual Conference as both senior pastor and as a conference consultant to local church early childhood education ministries. An ordained elder, she was appointed in 2018 to serve churches of the Texas Annual Conference as the director of We Love All God's Children, an initiative that seeks to equip United Methodist churches in the areas of children's discipleship early childhood literacy, and health. Her background includes service to the National Head Start Association, where she was a keynote and workshop speaker throughout the United States on issues surrounding early childhood education and addressed Congress on the many challenges of children and families in poverty. With those passions and with her background, we look forward to her message today titled, Let the Children Come. As we prepare our hearts for worship today, we do remember that we are in the season of Easter. We also acknowledge our Orthodox friends who celebrated Easter yesterday, the beginning of their Easter season. And with that in mind, we remember the Gospel of John, where on Easter evening, the disciples gathered together behind locked doors and Jesus appeared to them and said, peace be with you. So let us take a moment now to reflect as we begin our worship today. You may choose to close your eyes for a moment, take a deep breath, let it out slowly. We gather as did those first disciples with conflicting emotions, fear, exhaustion, racing minds and hearts, joy, anticipation, maybe a little apprehension about the future. So take a moment and know that the risen Christ is among us, speaking those same words, peace be with you. Reflect on what burdens and joys you bring to this service today. 
be aware of concern for those suffering from COVID and the fear of it, for those in India and South Asia. Be aware of those still waiting for Easter to dawn in their world. Be aware of the presence of Christ and hear those words, peace be with you. Amen. Good morning, Swo Park. Lord, I'm sorry. Good morning. St. Paul, Lord, I had the wrong, I'm in Zoom all the time. And to give that cross reference and those cross wires. And how many times have we been in a cross wire situation in our life? And we need the Lord to bring us back into the right lane and the right path. That's why the Bible says that we need to acknowledge him in all our ways and he will direct our paths. That's why we need the Lord to prepare us first. Just like I need to be prepared this morning. How about that, y'all? All right, let's go. All right. Sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary, Lord, for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. Thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary, Lord, for you. Wash me over again, wash me over again with your precious blood. Wash me over again, wash me over again, wash me over again. With your precious blood, wash me over again. Lord, prepare me yeah. to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. And with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. Lord, for you, you're my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord, come and feel the first thing in my soul, bread of heaven, feed it till I want no more, fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole, fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. Lord, prepare me, be sanctuary, yes, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I will be living sanctuary, Lord, for you, and my soul says yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary, Lord, for you. And when you get into those places where, I mean, I'm talking to a college now, okay? So we already know 145,000 different ways to call his name. But at the end of the day, his name is Jesus. Um, our last week's speaker, she spoke into something. <laughs> Speaker Lacey 
if I'm correct to say, she spoke into something and let me make this interactive. She um, made it interactive. So in your own way, if you could talk into those things amongst yourselves on what Jesus is to you. These are just the regular words, but we're just going to venture off and to make other verses. Okay? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 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 And to you he might be Savior, Savior, Savior. Savior, Savior, Savior. Savior, Savior, Savior. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And to somebody else he might be Master, Master, Master. I hear you. Master, Master, Master. Master, Master, Master. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Somebody on here says he's a healer, healer, healer. Healer, healer, healer. Healer, healer, healer. What's his name? Jesus, Jesus. Somebody else on here said he's a teacher, teacher, teacher. Won't he do that? Teacher, teacher, teacher. Teacher, teacher, teacher. Well, come on. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Mr. Brand said he's liberator, liberator, liberator. Come on. Liberator, liberator, liberator. Liberator, liberator, liberator. His name is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Well, I call him Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you all. Hey, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Whoever he is, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Mighty God, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Mary's baby, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Mighty God, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Amen. Awesome. We call that congregational choir from where I'm from. All right. So amen for y'all. All right. You all may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Those of you all that are going through, and we leave this with you, our theme this year was streams of life. Okay. Um, and as I hurry to my seat, um, I, I, I'm going to just leave you all with this here. Um, God bless you, Jennifer Schultz. Um, we're going to leave you with this because sometimes you go home with things. Um, you have a vocation where everything is left at your doorstep and you go home with things and you, sometimes you internalize some things. And sometimes you have to get help for some things that you need and, and to talk some wise counsel that you have some help with, that you help somebody else with, excuse me. So what I'm telling you is that the chef has to eat too. So wherever that you need to get, wherever you need to get, go get your medical counseling, your spiritual counseling, your professional counseling. Get what you have to get in order for you to be whole because the streams of life is for you first, because we go out to get beat up, ate up, drug up, tow up from the flow up. And when we come to you, okay, so we need you to be whole, but we need you to actually be whole before you come out. So there has to be self-care for you. So we're here to make sure that we acknowledge you, okay? So this is all for you. We need you to hold on just a little while longer. Hold on just a little while longer. It's all on your shoulders right now. Hold on just a little while longer. Everything will be all right. Everything will be all right. Come on, pray on. 
just a little while longer. Free all, just a little while longer. Free all, just a little while longer. Everything will be all right. Everything will be all right. I know somehow, I know some way we're gonna make it. No matter what the test. No matter what comes our way, we're going to make it. This is where hope comes in. With Jesus on our side, things will work out fine. We're going to make it. Sometimes down, almost level to the ground. I said one more day, one more day. God has given us one more day. We shall overcome. We shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe. We shall overcome someday. Oh, everything will be all right. We're going to make it because God has given us one more day. Good morning, my friends. I invite you now um, to join me as we um, hear from God this morning through the reading of God's word. Hear these words from the Gospel of Mark, friends. He left that place and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. And crowds again gathered around him. And as was his custom, he again taught them. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them and blessed them. He left that place and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. And crowds again gathered around him. And as was his custom, he again taught them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me, please? Loving God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing unto you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. 
Amen. What an honor it is to be here with y'all. Um, for the past couple of weeks, it's funny because Facebook has sending me has been sending me memories of this time of year there at St. Paul. Uh, most of those memories are of me working diligently to finish all of my assignments. And then subsequent posts celebrating the completion of said assignments. You know, I'd love to spend my time this morning sharing with you about my time at St. Paul School of Theology, the season that truly changed me and shaped me and gave me courage to lead the church I'd been called to lead. I'd love for you to hear about my little silo community churches I served during my time there. Wellington and Napoleon. And yes, Waterloo was right between the, them on that little uh, road there between Wellington and Napoleon. Those congregations that had served as student appointments since 1959 uh, when St. Paul was founded. There, both of them on the banks of the mighty Missouri River. Instead, I want to share with you about a season prior to my time at St. Paul and a season post St. Paul. Frankly, the first of those two tales is a tale of two children from my hometown behind the pine curtain of Northeast Texas. It's the story of two precious little boys, one who came into my life at the age of three, the other at the age of two. Both of them born into the vicious cycle of poverty that had controlled the direction of their family's lives for generations. Both of them too young to understand the implications of being born into the downward spiral of extreme poverty. Their lack of prenatal care, uh, at least for mama, and then health care for the child, compounded by extremely poor nutrition. The handsome three-year-old came into my classroom that first day of school and I could sense the fear and the hesitation that he was feeling. But you know what? I didn't worry. I was Miss Jill and Miss Jill could become any child's best friend just like that. But that was not the case with Kevin. He never came around. He regularly cursed me. He hit me and he did the same to all the other children in our class and the children and teachers in our school. After a number of attempts to make contact with his mama, I uh, wanted to schedule with her a home visit. I finally dropped in unannounced one afternoon and found her at home. That day I realized where Kevin had learned those curse words. The house was sparsely furnished and drug paraphernalia and empty alcohol bottles were scattered around in place of the toys that you might expect to be strewn around the home of a young mother and a child. I would later learn that Kevin's mama and her mama were both long-term drug addicts who regularly traded food stamps intended to feed them and Kevin instead traded for alcohol and drugs. And oh, by the way, both of the women were deeply involved in prostitution. Two-year-old Grant arrived at the front door of our child development center just a couple of days after his arrival from Venezuela. This young asylum seeker who suffered from multiple health issues due to malnutrition and a lack of health care was thrust that day into a strange world with very strange people who spoke a very strange language that, language that Grant did not understand. We'd learned through an interpreter that he and his mom and three brothers uh, ended up in our small town after his dad sold himself into a slavery situation to get them away from the poverty and violence of their homeland. We'd also learned that the five of them arrived in Atlanta, Texas with one backpack each. Their only possessions meant to equip them to start a new life in America. Although there were such significant differences in the background of both of these boys, they shared many similarities. Both were born into dire situations that would impact them for a lifetime. 
Both were victims of the negative effects of a lack of proper nutrition and health care. Both had been regularly exposed to extreme violence at an early age, and both had spent their short lives in homes with a lack of proper sanitation, supervision, and without many of the resources that you and I tend to consider as absolute necessities. One of the two would drop out of school in the seventh grade. He's now incarcerated, part of the overflowing inmate population in the Texas Department of Corrections. The other would graduate near the top of his class in the top 10% of Atlanta High School and would go on to excel in college where he will be graduating in my, this month um, with his um, MBA now. One small town. Two little boys with similar life challenges. So what was it that made the difference? What was it that changed the trajectory of the lives of one of these precious gifts from God? One day Jesus was in Judea. On that day, a great crowd came to hear him preach. There were men and women and single folks that I am certain were probably um, given a side eye to the one they'd never seen up close and personal before. There were mamas and daddies, grandmas and grandpas, aunts and uncles, cousins, in-laws, outlaws. And when a crowd like that gathers, you can be certain that there's a huge group of kids with them. On this day, the disciples, perhaps caught up in their own prestigious positions of self-importance, saw all these children as a nuisance and an annoyance. Their position seems to have been, friends, this is serious stuff here we're dealing with. We don't have time for kids, and Jesus, he certainly doesn't have time for them. Now, it's 21st century Christians, it's hard to imagine the disciples taking this sort of um, position. It would certainly be considered rude, uncaring, and cold. Definitely these days, the complete opposite of what um, my former Bishop Schnazy would call radical hospitality. But I'm sad to tell you that I've been in churches that in their own subtle or maybe not so subtle ways fail to extend hospitality to our children. I well remember a former congregation where a group of people bitterly fought against opening up the annual children's Easter extravaganza to the community. And the reasons went a little bit like this. We don't know who those kids are. Those kids are going to run wild through the building. Those kids are going to stop up the toilet, and you know that those kids are going to break something. Now, this group undoubtedly thought they were doing the right thing, and so did the disciples. The disciples thought they were doing what was best, yet Jesus, well, he took a very different position. Do not push these children away, he said don't ever get between them and me. And then he went on to proclaim that unless you accept God's kingdom in this, with the simplicity of a child, you're never going to get in. Strong words, right? And maybe to some strange words. So what did Jesus mean by them? Well, as always, there have been folks who've taken the words literally because they believe that everything in the Bible must be taken literally. But this morning... Let's all agree that Jesus' words in this case are not to be taken literally. That requires some interpretation. So here's how you and I this morning on this day, May 3rd, 2021, might interpret Jesus' words. Friends, I fervently fervently believe that in order to truly let the children come and in order to truly become like a child, we have to be freed from our prejudices. You see, children don't understand about skin color and socioeconomics. They don't understand about religious differences and politics, and they don't even understand about disabilities and so many other differences. Oh, for sure, before they get to become an adolescent, they do. Many mirroring the biases of their peers and, and their families. 
that very young children have an openness to all. They just don't see the differences that we adults see. When I first began working in Head Start centers throughout the Southwest, I was one of the only light-skinned persons on our, most of our campuses. I quickly became known as the book lady or the music lady because I always brought a book or a musical in, instrument into those classrooms that I'd visit. The best part of my day was when I took the time to sit down on the floor with a group of kiddos and read or sing with them while always having a couple of those children in my lap. After a couple of visits, I would become Miss Jill and I would learn the names of the children. And one year after a few weeks after we returned from Christmas break, as usual, there was a sweet little girl who climbed up into my lap just like she'd done regularly when I'd visited her classroom. Suddenly I noticed that she was looking at amazement at my hands while I played a little keyboard. And I thought, oh, how great. She's realized what an extremely talented musician I am. And she's gonna go, oh, Miss Jill, you play so beautifully. But that's not what she said. She rubbed my hand and she looked at her hand and then she looked back at my hand and she said, Miss Jill, you're different. She didn't say, Miss Steele, you're white. And I'm not even sure that she quite understood how I was different. The interesting thing was that she just at that moment noticed the difference. Children are so innocent and beautiful in that respect. And I think that Jesus must have had that in mind when he said, let the children come. And unless you become as a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You see, I firmly believe that in order to truly let the children come and in order to truly become like a child, we have to be freed from our prejudices. We should also tap into that childlike sense of awe and wonder that we all had once upon a time, but may have lost as we grew a little older. Somewhere along the line, I suppose most all of us used the child within us. Karl Barth, of course, one of the world's preeminent theologians wrote these words, listen to this. God's world can be experienced only in wonder. The Christian should be struck by wonder about his own being. We ought to have a sense of wonder about the world, about one another, and about all of humanity. In my vast collection of books, including many that I accumulated over my three years at St. Paul School of Theology, one of my favorites is Children's Letters to God. It's a beautiful collection of actual children's prayers, and many of you have seen this book, so remember with me some of the words of children, like, Dear God, where do people come from? I hope you can explain it better than my daddy, Helen. Dear God, I never did think that orange went very well with purple until I saw your sunset last night. That was cool, Eugene. Dear God, could you please send me a burning bush in my backyard? My dad never can get that grill started, Sherry. I believe that just maybe hearing this story about the mamas and the daddies and the grandmas and the grandpas and the aunts and the uncles and the in-laws and the outlaws and all those children, Jesus is suggesting to us that we need to recapture our childlike imagination. It's fascinating to me how Walt Disney World understands this, but as the church, we seem to miss it. We so often become the victims of routine since we've always done it like that. And we lose our spontaneity. You know, it's interesting to me that after the disciples try to turn the children away, a rich young ruler comes to Jesus. The children, Jesus accepted, but the young ruler, well, he sends the young ruler away. Maybe that sequence is trying to tell us something. Maybe Jesus is saying that this man is the opposite of these children. 
He's proud, success oriented, image conscious. He's got everything figured out. But to see the treasure of the gospel, he needs to become like a child. Friends, in order to truly let the children come, and in order to truly become like a child, we must be first freed from our prejudice. We should also tap into that childlike sense of awe and wonder that we all had once upon a time, but we may have lost as we grew older. We must also keep in mind how important children are to God. After all, God used children to help usher in the kingdom. You remember that on Palm Sunday, as Jesus made his triumphant entry in Jerusalem, there were shouts of Hosanna, son of David. And this enraged the Pharisees. Those Pharisees then come to Jesus and say, tell all those folks, including those children there, to hush, to be quiet with all your hooping and hollering. And Jesus answers, if I told them to stop, even the stones would shout it out. And if you still don't believe that God used children to usher in the kingdom, let me remind you that our Savior came to us in the form of a child. You see, only innocence and freshness can usher in the kingdom. Innocence and freshness. Yet how did our world treat the holy innocence? Well, Herod proceeded to kill the children who were two years old and younger. We read that and we're so repulsed by it. It sounds so primitive and they were so horrible back in the day. But I wonder, would we rather read some modern statistics on children? 35,000 children around the world die of malnutrition every day. More than 100 million children have died of poverty-related causes in the world during the last 10 years. 12 million children today are growing up homeless. And 80 million children under the age of 13 work in sweatshops and factories. 2 million children have been killed and 4 million wounded in wars during the past 15 years. And in the United States of America, homicide is the third leading cause of death in children. A child is killed by gunfire in the United States of America, my country, every two hours. And a child in the United States is reported abused every 11, every 11 seconds. And in my great state of Texas, more children were reported abused last year than were reported in Sunday school in all of the United Methodist churches in the United States last year. In the shadow of our steeples, children living in poverty who are not kindergarten ready due to a lack of affordable excellence in preschools and daycares are already at an increased odd of never, ever, ever catching up with their peers. And our year off due to COVID has only intensified the circumstances of those who make up this statistic. And if they don't read on level by the third grade, chances are they're never going to finish high school. They'll be incarcerated. They'll give birth as a single teenager. They'll struggle with addiction and domestic violence and be sucked into that vicious cycle of poverty that has been the black hole of hopelessness their family has experienced for generations. Yet our God, the creator of the universe, values children so much that God used them to help usher in the kingdom. God came in the form of a child and was born into poverty. In the Texas Annual Conference, we've implemented a strategy not only to help us be educated about the needs of the children and families that are part of our communities, but also to help local churches address the issue of children and families who've struggled to break the cycle of poverty. We Love All God's Children um, equips local churches in becoming more missionally vital by thinking creatively about how to serve underserved children from birth to 11 years of age and their families in each community's unique ministry setting. We do this by focusing holistically on three critical areas, discipleship or spiritual learning, early literacy, 
and help. By looking at a church's unique context of ministry and a community's true needs, we can partner with existing agencies and organizations in order to change the trajectory of the lives of the children in our towns. For they are all our children. Friends, at some point in the mid 20th century, the church began to pass responsibility for loving our neighbor and need onto others. Local, state, and federal governments and organizations, anyone could take the wheel. Yet we, you and I, were called by God to love our neighbor, to heal the sick, to feed the hungry and clothe the naked, to care for the stranger, free the oppressed, to be a compassionate, caring presence and work to develop social structures consistent with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what changed the trajectory of the life of one of those two little boys. The people of God work together to heal, feed, clothe, care for, and free Grant, his brothers and his mama as together. That community became the hands and feet of Christ to the strangers in our land. He became one of our kids. I wish I could say the same for Kevin. My heart grieves for the potential in that child that was totally lost through the inaction, the procrastination, and even apathy of folks just like me who could have made a difference, but we didn't. And Kevin remained one of those kids. The Texas Annual Conference through We Love All God's Children is committed to walking alongside local churches as we love all God's children. As we become as a child freed from our prejudice, filled with awe and wonder and remember that God valued children so much that God used kids to help usher in the kingdom. You know, the vision for We Love All God's Children was birthed for me at St. Paul School of Theology through a contextual education class that was led by Dr. Angela Sims. I'm so always in awe of how God works in our lives. It would be 11 years later that Bishop Scott Jones would sit on my couch in Beaumont, Texas and cast his vision of We Love All God's Children and invite me to lead this initiative. The bishop's vision was remarkably similar to the one birthed in me on Truman Road in a St. Paul School of Theology classroom. Some of you prepare for new appointments, new ministry opportunities, or even for a bit of a break. Hallelujah. I would ask that you be intentional in letting the children, all God's children, come. For Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. And he took the children in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. She's basically saying, everyone born has a place at the table. Race, creed, color, nationality, okay? Everyone born a place at the table. Everyone born clean water and bread. Shelter a space, safe place for growing. Everyone born a star overhead, and God will delight for creators of justice and joy, compassion, and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice, and joy. Just an unjust, a place at the table. Abused and abused, we need to forgive. 
hurt and unheard, abused, and need to forgive him. But just and unjust, a new way to live. And God will delight when we are creators of justice and truth, compassion and peace. And God will delight when we are creators of justice. Justice and joy for everyone born, a place at the table, you without fear and simply to be, to work and to speak out, to witness, to worship, to everyone born, the right to be free, and God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. And God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy, justice and joy. Justice and joy. Justice and joy. Thank you so much, Odell. Um, as you all have seen throughout the semester, Odell, or Bishop as some of us know him, has a gift of setting the tone wherever he goes. <laughs> I'd like to share something a little bit fun about him that you all may not know uh, as we see him off into, into new ministries in the summer and the country, is that when we start um, our meeting planning at St. Paul School of Theology for this worship group, our co-conspirators we call us, is that he always addresses the whole group of people by name, by title, or by nickname. And he that's just one of the ways that he honors uh, the uniqueness that everybody brings to the table. And it's one of the ways that Odell just embodies his love of God. Um, and his love of God is really evident in his joy for life and his love of the word. And God in turn just works so beautifully through him to touch us all um, in music and in mischief, in prayer and in prophecy and in laughter and lament. So Odell, thank you so much. Thank you for blessing our community with your creativity, your collaboration, your presence, your wisdom, and your proclamation. So if you all will please just take a moment to either unmute or give um, just fingers of appreciation for our Odell. Send him blessings, you. Bishop. Appreciate you all. Thank, thank you, Odell. You. Thank you. Bless you, thank you. It's my honor. We also celebrate someone else who's been such an integral partner in the worship life of St. Paul School of Theology for many years, and that is Reverend Rodney Newman. Uh, today is his last official chapel service with us in the position that he served, but I know it will not be the last. Since 2007, Rod has been a fixture at OCU, coordinating worship as university chaplain and director of religious life, serving as the director of the Wesley Center, mentoring students, contributing to the rich community life in Oklahoma, as he taught so many, many things about the religious life and in particular Celtic Christianity and spirituality, which included a study abroad trip in Ireland that I would like to go on someday, Rod, just gonna put that out there. And for five years, uh, while also serving as senior pastor of Bridgeview United Methodist Church, Rod has taken the helm of worship and spiritual formation for St. Paul at OCU. Anyone who works with Rod knows of his gifts for grounding any moment with poignant, attentive prayer. It's certainly rooted in his deep spiritual life his study and embrace of the Celtic way of seeking after and resting in the mystery and wonder and awe of God. I have been blessed in our collaboration, Rod, 
especially through a year of pandemic worship leadership. What a great partner you have been. Though we have all had days of being rattled, frustrated, weary, sick of Zoom, you are a steady co-conspirator again and again, grounding each of us on the worship team and as a worshiping community and the love of God. For your leadership and worship, your mentorship and PLM and preaching, all, all that and more, we thank you, Rod. And we celebrate you today and surround you in prayer as you step into leadership at New Hope United Methodist Church. So please go on gallery view and celebrate Rod. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful and I appreciate it so much. I love all of you. Thank you, Rod and Odell. Now, my friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and fill you with power and peace today and all the days of your life. Amen. Amen.